All right. Clap one on three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How are you feeling? Great. Fantastic. Yeah. Huh. I mean, I thought of a million things I could have complained of about. Course. Of course. Of course. But, I, but you know what? I chose not to. You chose gratitude. I did. Gratitude. I did. What the hell is that? Gratitude. There's <laughs> absolutely no need. The fact that they didn't say that once in the it, movie Ratatouille is just a missed opportunity. It is. It is. I saw one of these videos on the TikTok or the, the yeah. Instagram the other day, and it's a guy yelling out of his like New York apartment window at a woman on the street going, if I could cook you anything right now, what would you want? And she responded, ratatouille. And I'm like, that's a, that's bullshit. This has been set up. Suddenly he has everything to make a ratatouille in his apartment. Like he's cutting mm -hmm. up like, you know, whatever these squash shit things are. Um, <laughs> I've got nothing against squash for the record. But anyway, like summer squash. Of course. Anyway, I was just like, first of all, I, I, I'm annoyed by the fact that you're trying to make this look like it was organic. Yeah. And two, I was like, who on earth, if I was that woman, I'd be like, no, I'm not going to tell you I want ratatouille. Like that is the most specific. If someone said to me, yeah. I could cook you anything in the world right now, what would it be? Ratatouille is not in the top 10 things. Oh and yeah. It's not dislike ratatouille. It's just an insane answer. Um, I, actually thought it was going to be like her answer was going to be like equal pay you know or something like i thought ah. it was going to be like some sort of uh thing like that i didn't think she'd have an answer um but wow okay okay yeah yeah look did the movie ratatouille make me go oh i think I try ratatouille it did it absolutely did it also made me go strawberries and cheese together huh neither here nor there but the point is i just i'm not a fancy lady and i i just don't think like if someone well first if someone yelled out to me i'm most likely not going to respond um but if someone yells and is like if you could eat anything right now what would it be i don't care what time of day it is my answer is going to be a cheeseburger yeah they're my favorite food in the world. It's what I want. Or I'll them. take a potato in literally any form. Yeah. Dealer's choice. Doesn't matter. I don't even know what I would necessarily say. I think, you know what? This is what it would be. Hey, if I could cook you anything in the world right now, what would it be? Me. To go to the trouble. That would probably be what, because don't, don't worry about it. Like, I would be oh. like, why are you cooking me an elaborate meal, stranger? Oh, yeah. I My gut instinct would be like, oh, no, 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 please don't. I'm not yeah. worried. Like that's don't the, worry about it. I'm good. You know, don't want to put you out, even though you're the one asking. Like, yeah. I and, and I look, know. I don't know what the deal yeah. is between these two. Obviously, I believe that they know each other ahead of time or or of at least course. have had a conversation. But the other thing is, is that I'm like, if if I'm in New York City and a man yells at me, what can I cook you? I'll cook you anything. What kind of podcast are you listening to right now, folks? You couldn't pay me enough money to go up to that apartment. Hell no. <laughs> are you gonna serve it with a nice Chianti? Give me a break. Well, I mean, I'm just, I thank you so much. Uh, I'm just convinced uh, that the majority of videos that come out, like 99.9% .9 of them are planned out in some way in advance. Oh, yeah. Everything that's like a beautiful, like something happens and somebody's like surprised. I'm like, I just don't know if I buy it. I've become jaded. I, I will listen. Welcome to my life. Um, yeah, I often feel like I can tell when people are acting. Sure. I often feel that way in a lot of videos. I'm like that person's, this isn't real. I know. And it's such a letdown. Yeah. And I'm sure there are some that are real, but it of just course. takes away from it when you're like, they really set this up. You know, what I liked is that we started this with you being grateful. 
your gratitude. And th- I have managed to take it into something negative. Why? Oh, well, if we want to continue with negativity, went to McDonald's, asked for, uh, didn't think to ask what toy was out because everywhere it's been saying, as of Halloween, it's the new Disney 100 toys. And I was like, please, please. So I ordered uh, two of the toys, um, an extra to go with the Happy Meal that was already in my order, uh, and then learned we did not get those Disney toys yet. And I was simmering in a rage. Like, obviously, I wasn't mad at them or anything. It's not their fault. So I just took my food and said, thank you so much. And Drove away and went, oh, man. Like, I was disappointed. Yeah. I was disappointed. Well. I mean, he's so cute. I did run out. I did run out to get a, a happy hour um, before the record today because uh, I was like, I'm dying to see these things in person. We should not be doing this because they should be paying us to talk about this. They should they be. really should. But all I'll say is, is that they're adorable and they're bigger than I thought they'd be. But also flat. That's cute. Wasn't expecting them to be flat. The fact that you called it a happy hour is amazing. Damn it. Didn't even, didn't even. But. Didn't even bump me. They didn't even pay us. So you don't have to call it by the right name. Exactly. I can, I'll call it a hoopy doop if I want. A hoopy doop. (laughs) Thank you so much. Look, if they want to, if they want to start paying us, then I'll happily talk about it, not say that. I'm upset that all of Canada didn't get it the same time America did. It's possible not all of America has it. It's possible there are parts of Canada that have it. We do not yet. And I'm, I mean, maybe as of the release of this, we do, but I'm going to be, I'm going to be searching. Do I need them? No, no, absolutely not. I'm, I, oh, I want to say, knee deep but i am shoulder deep in collectibles i don't need more yeah i on a daily basis say things like gosh i wish i only enjoyed one thing like just disney or just lego or just harry potter or just you know cats that are also looks like food you know just like i wish just one thing but i have so many things that i love Makes it difficult. Yeah, I uh, I keep cleaning out my house and sending like mm. bags and bags of things to the Goodwill, and it doesn't it doesn't make a dent. Well, because half your bedroom is full of my shit. Listen, <laughs> <laughs> listen, and that's that's a joy and a privilege. But um, yeah, before I, Christmas, I, I'm gonna have to do some reorganizing in that bedroom because I in, in one of my spare bedrooms, I I can't walk in there currently. If you open the door, sure. you hit stuff. And uh, I think I just need to, I need to cull. I need to cull the herd. I get that. Yeah. If you need me to come down there to take my shit out. I do. go through my shit. To take- I need you to be, I need you to come and do it in person. And yeah. I am unanimous in that. That's a Laurel. That's a mother Laurelism. She, if she says something she really believes, she, she'll tell you that she's unanimous in it. Uh, yeah, no, I absolutely need you to come. And I won't hear otherwise. And if we're saying it on here, it's a work trip. It's a business expense. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. How many Happy Meals are we going to get? Oh, it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. It's be one of those things where it's like, hey, guys, how many of those toys you got back there? Okay. If I give you a tote, will you just empty them into the, <laughs> just empty the box into the tote? Well, it depends how big is my suitcase because this is the problem that I have. I get so much when I'm there because I get so excited and over the top that I buy so much it won't fit, even though I almost every trip buy a new bag to to, to come home with. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just to the point where it's like, well, I'll have to leave this little bit behind. But then when I go next time, I'm not just bringing that home. I'm bringing that plus what couldn't fit last time and what here's what i think you need to do the next time you come pack a suitcase but not your largest put it in your largest suitcase oh sure then when you you're only checking one bag here and then when you go back you've got a larger suitcase and the other one that makes sense 
And what I need to do is not buy anything new. That's mm. not realistic <laughs> for you. It's not, it's not because I just, there are just so many options there that we don't have here. And we don't know how to go to a store without filling a cart. It doesn't feel good. I know that makes it sound like I have maybe a light shopping addiction. I don't actually think I do. I would admit it if I did. Oh, I'll admit I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And look, I know that uh, it's just, it's a case of, you know what? In the moment, it makes me feel happy. So I'm giving myself joy. This yep. was the year I said, I'm just going to do more joyful things. Yep. And apparently that's what that is. Totally. Unboxing shit on the internet. To the 10 people who care, thank you so much. It's more than 10 people. <laughs> oh, it's just such a silly, like, what am I even doing? Like, I just get so into it that I can't stop. And I, I could be professional and, like, buy one of those fancy stands and have it so you only see my hands and open the, the thing and not swear so that it's appropriate for children, but I that's, can't help whether I swear or not. That's not and if what I you bring if I get table. a good one, then it's oh fuck. And it's words that I shouldn't be saying, but it is what it is. And I guess one section kids, of this it's none of those kids haven't heard before. Oh, I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Uh I just I get so many things and then I don't know what to do with them. So I put them in the corner on the floor behind me because it's kind of my only space of free space. And then I get it cleared out and I'm like, I feel really good about it. And within a day, I'm already piling stuff back over there because I just don't have time to deal with it in the moment. Hmm. It's just madness. Mm -hmm. It's madness. I get that. I get and now that. I'm all Christmas brain. And I have a child with a birthday between now and Christmas. So I'm I'm just like thinking of gifts and I'm already on that. And I'm like, when do I start just really bringing them in? And then once I get them here, where are they going to go? That's my current concern is that my office is full. My bedroom is full. My second bedroom is full. I'm like, I don't know where I'm going to put any Christmas gifts. I just had mm. my first package arrive of Christmas gifts. And I was like, I got nowhere to put these. I got to reorganize in here. The and I know what you're thinking. Of you the haven't... two of us, of you having me come in, and that's our goal. It's like, I'm here for four days. Yep. We're getting this done. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's going to be the two of us half opening things, sitting on the floor being like, look. Yep. Day three, we haven't left the couch. Like day three, yeah. we're in a pile of wrappers. Like, the, yeah, no, yeah. no, no. But I need you to come to do it. <laughs> oh, well, if you need it for yeah, work. It's for work. Uh, also, that means that we could also maybe get in a Disney Christmas Day. Just putting that out there. Fuck. Yeah. Uh, Look, I'll there's say. There's so it. many new I've foods been... this year. So many new ones. Oh, I live uh, for Disney. You know this. Um it just, it send, it's a joy. It's just a joy. And last night, after after a dream that I had last night, I could use a joy. I'm going to tell you this. Just bare bones. I'm sure, well, you you like uh, dream analysis. I'm sure it comes down Do to. Do I? <laughs> I'm sure this comes down to uh, stress, but it had a really weird way of uh, manifesting itself. So for some reason... I was working for Saturday Night Live. I oh. was like a behind the scenes type person, but it was like my first day and I don't know what I was hired to do, but whatever that job was, I was there. I was confident, ready to go for what job they wanted me to do. And they turned to me and went, hey, we actually need you to do like to record some audio stuff for us. So like boom mic sort of situation except it involved this set of like coveralls that had four like uh, 
four things that had to be plugged into the suit I was wearing that somehow recorded whatever the people were saying. So I said, were you having just, to stand holding the big boom mic? Or I was... did have to stand okay. holding a thing, but also somehow it just weirdly plugged into my chest. I don't understand. <laughs> like into wow, these. Wow, okay. <laughs> not like it didn't like plug into a tit. Like it plugged into these little silver things on, on the front of my coveralls. So I, but I kept repeatedly telling them like, guys, I just, I, this is not what I was hired to do. If you want this done properly, I'm not the person to do, don't throw this at me please don't like, this is a bad idea. And they're like, you're going to be great. It's going to be fine. Will Farrell was there. Mm. Uh, so they were like, do this, whatever. So we go through a bit. I'm recording. Um, and then at the end, the guy was like, okay, now of your four things that are plugged in, I need you to unplug one of them and plug it into this machine. So it will like take everything you've just recorded and put it into whatever. Well, only three of the things were plugged in. The one they wanted me to plug in was not plugged into me at all. So I was like, that means it didn't record. And I was like, God damn it, they're going to get mad at me. And I, it wasn't my fault. I kept telling them repeatedly. It wasn't, it like, this isn't me. I can't do this. But they kept pushing it at me. And then we're all kind of like, I guess in the studio, just kind of like all hanging out. And we look outside and we can see the moon. And the moon starts like in the middle. Suddenly it, there's like a black circle and the black circle fills, expands. It fills the moon. The moon explodes. And I'm oh. like, that's intense. And then the sun is suddenly there and we're like, thank God for the sun. And then the same thing happens to the sun. And we're like, what does that mean? And everything starts shaking and like the world just implodes. And it, as like, as my body is imploding, the first, like the last thing I could think of was my, my, I thought of my youngest and I went, oh my God, he's going to be so scared. And then I woke up and I was like, oh my God, thank God. I didn't just die in some sort of weird apocalypse. I did not go back to sleep. <laughs> I don't think it takes a dream analyst to say, feels like you're feeling like you got the weight of the world on your shoulders. <laughs> Weird. I don't know where you got that from. Wowzer. Wow. Yeah. It was uh, wa watching the moon explode and then watching the sun explode and then realizing, wait a second, can we survive without the sun? Eh. And then everyone just, it was also the rumbling and everybody's shaking and being like, is this it? And it was like, that's where I'm going to die. SNL, get out. I mean, they've guaranteed it. Now I'll never go in that building. <laughs> I can't, I can't. You're going to boycott 30 Rock? <laughs> what Can you see the sun or moon from this position? What, is, what if we're spot? taking a delightful tour with one of the, uh, the, the Jack McBrayer plaid types from 30 Rock? Oh, I, once, once you've been standing in that building and seeing it shake and then suddenly the world ends, I think maybe I don't want to go there. Yeah. I think this is a stress dream. I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't already know. <laughs> I just assumed, I didn't even think I was that stressed in the moment, but well, well, I think that, well, I think that there's like feelings of of being like uh, out of your element. So I do sure. think that that perhaps this is tied to your uh, unboxing videos, which is interesting because we were talking about that sure. just before you brought this up. Um, I think oh, it's that I wonder feeling if that's of what like- made me think of it. I think subconsciously, yes. Sure. I think that it's, it's like you, cause you were like, oh, earlier you were saying, well, I make these yes. videos for like 10 people and what am I doing? And they're not this and I could do this. and all of these kinds of, sure. uh, you know, critical thoughts. And I think that that dream is a manifestation of that, where it's like, you're doing this thing that's kind of out of your wheelhouse sure. and you're, you're keep telling them like, this isn't what I do. And then something went wrong and it's like, well, I told you this isn't what I do. Like, I think that this is like, I oh. think it's an anxiety, an anxiety you're subconsciously Shit. having. It very well could be. I mean, yeah. to be clear to the, I mean, it's not 10, but to the people, um, they're they're always so uh beautiful and positive and they're very excited about what i've called our collection i love that because i've just i've started calling it the collective collection because i'm like well it just belongs to all of us 
Yeah. Because I accidentally said like an, oh, look what we got. And I was like, we, well, I guess it well, you're in it together now. Yeah. Yeah. We're in this. Um, so they've been nothing but positive and it's been very beautiful. Um, but yeah, the first thing I think when I wake up every day is I should, I need to post that video. Mm -hmm. I got to get it out there. So mm -hmm. it's like, maybe I should be posting it later in the day so that my brain isn't thinking about it overnight. I mean, yeah. there was nothing wrong with having Will Ferrell show up, I guess. Yeah. But I also love that there was no part of me that was like, oh my God, it's Will Ferrell. I was just very professional, except a little bit whiny because I didn't want to do sound. <laughs> <laughs> just because I was like, I don't want to plug things into my, you know, it was almost like the connection of what you'd plug like um like a guitar the, that weird connection you'd plug in there were four of those on my chest that had to be plugged into this suit so, so it was to the suit though it wasn't to your flesh correct well that's better than that's better than the other so it was like something you would plug into an amp so it's like you did you stick it in or did you a little like <laughs> I am more than okay with the fact that only the two of us are going to laugh at that. Yep. Uh, jokes that are 30 years old, folks. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, that lasted so, the test of time, though. It really did. It yeah. really did. But yeah, no, I think that this is all connected to uh, your growth as a public figure. <laughs> public figure. Oh, I own it. I don't know. If I if I was a public figure, I shouldn't be going out in public half the time the way I'm dressed. You think I should? I've that's taken to a crop top uh, that you gave me actually. That's incredibly that. comfortable, but um, it's it's a little more cropped than what I would be accustomed to. Sure. And uh, as a lady of a certain age. Sometimes we dip below. <laughs> and so I always, always make sure I'm wearing something over top of it. Like I have a hoodie over top of it or something. Uh, but today I was reaching above my head to take strands of Halloween lights out of my window. And I had that moment of, please tell me everything <laughs> is in where it belongs because I am extending my body in the front window of my home in broad daylight everything was in unlike that <laughs> fourth plug for the audio everything was in yeah yeah well listen um before we get into the episode we would be remiss yeah. if we didn't mention this um as i've talked about on this show before there are there are people in pop culture that become characters on true crime and cocktails dave grohl um you know, so many Blanche, Keanu Reeves, like there's so many people that are mentioned time and time again that they feel like they're a part of of our collective uh, community here. Yeah. Um, and obviously we have talked about the show Friends many, many times, certainly oh, yeah. uh, on our Patreon as well. It's come up a lot. And and the world lost Matthew Perry uh, this past week. Um, it was since our last record. This is the first time we recorded since his passing. And uh, what a shock, what a, what a loss, what a, I mean, listen, I called Christy and anytime one of us calls the other person, it's serious. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because the first word, once you see the other is calling the first words out of your mouth need to be, I'm fine. Yeah. Like I'm okay. It's yeah. not, I'm a, okay, whatever. but yes, yeah. that's, that's usually um, how it goes. Yeah, I was having like a day of like, well, I was building, I was building my Buzz Lightyear costume for, of course, the Patreon brunch, um, because that was the only day I and time I had to do it. So I was doing that, and my husband had gone out, and so it was me, and the three kids at home, and I was exhausted, and I I was like, we're just ordering dinner because I can't deal, and then I was like, I'm now, it's been all day. I've had nothing happening on my phone. I'm now going to go have a shower because I want to be clean and then get back to this costume building. Yes. I was in that shower 10, maybe 15 minutes. <laughs> I came out to 
a text from my husband, a, t- a missed call from you, a text from you saying, please call me when you get this. <laughs> and as I was getting out of the shower, my teenager came barreling down the hall and yelled at me through the door to be like, I've just heard. And it was the two of us screaming back and forth to be heard and being having a full conversation yelling like buffoons. And it was just me going, what? What happened? And like, it, yeah, it was shocking. It's shocking. You didn't, you don't expect it. Sometimes you're like, maybe if someone hits a certain age, you're like, it's less shocking. But, oh, who am I kidding? Uh, Betty White shocked me to my core. And she was 99. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. I I stand by. I just don't think the world's rebounded uh, since. But um, I didn't see this one coming. I didn't see this coming for a while. Like, I thought we had a long time to go. Before the Friends cast starts to go? Yes. Oh, my God. Yes, so did I. So uh, did I. God. And, and I mean, you know, it's been a comfort show of mine for decades. Yeah, listen. And and you know what? I think it actually has been for me too. It's funny because when people ask my comfort show, I'm like, I don't really have comfort shows. I have like movies that I rewatch over and over and over again. But if sure. I am being honest, Friends is the one show that like, it was one of those shows where at the time I would have said like, oh, I don't, yeah, I guess I watch it when it's on. Spoiler alert. I don't think I ever missed an episode. Same with Seinfeld. I was like, I think I've seen all of these episodes. Um, sure. But Friends is the one that if I'm flipping around and it's on, I'm always going to stop and watch friends it is just it is what it is it was that time in our lives and listen if the show wasn't for you that's wonderful it was for us and we liked it and that is what it is um so we you know we don't need to yuck anybody's yums on that um but you know i saw very quickly i saw a uh therapist on on probably on tiktok uh but i did think that the message was very interesting because There are times like this where we lose people that we don't personally know. And there are some people who feel very um, bereaved. And then there's other people that say, why are you acting like this? Why are you in so much grief? This is somebody you never met. How could you possibly be feeling lost? And what he was kind of saying that I thought was really interesting was that our brains can't process the, the like context in which we have happy memories. So if there is a lot of happy memories surrounding a specific person, if that, if, if our core brain subconscious was made to feel delight, joy, happiness, laughter, all of these kinds of things, and it was connected to seeing a specific person, the amount of time you spent with that person, our brains can't distinguish between well, that's my my physical blood relative, and that's someone I watched on TV for hundreds of hours. You spent a sure. lot of time with that person. So yeah. even if it's not, you know, it's a character that they play, not the real person, et cetera. But I just thought it was a really good way of looking at it because I do feel like I sometimes am like, oh, like I that, that one really hurt. Taylor Hawkins, like, gutted me. That yeah. one gutted me. Um, and... Uh, and this was another one that that just really hit hard. And I think, again, it's like when you think about the amount of time and with TV people also, <clears throat> I often talk about how like they come into your home. When you watch TV, these people yeah. are coming to you metaphorically as opposed to like a movie star where you have to go to sit in a theater. I mean, you don't have to do that as much anymore, but, you know, back in the day, it's just a different thing. So. So yes, so to anyone who is, has felt the the grief and shock of and loss um, and feels the the the, the level of sadness, uh, an intense level of sadness, um, you're not alone. Uh, it's quite sad. What a what a loss for the the community um, of of com- comedy and television, and also all of uh, obviously the the philanthropy work that he was doing regarding helping people um, with addiction issues. Uh, a huge loss. And uh, we send uh, love to everyone affected, anyone who's feeling it. Yeah. Yeah, look, I'll say it. Um, I have been devastated by certain uh, celebrity deaths. And you do you have that moment where you kind of almost feel silly for yeah. being like that level of sad. 
for someone that you've never met. Um, but I, I will say it, Betty White, I like just mentioning it to my husband, I full started crying and I said out loud to him, like, why? I don't even know why I'm crying. I didn't know her. And he's like, but it's okay to feel this level because of her loss was a loss. And again, <laughs> said it recently, I'll say it again. This world has not been the same without her. I know. It's gone down. But you also spent a lot of time with her. I mean, you have watched the entire yeah. Golden Girls multiple catalog times, yeah. many times. Like when you're spending that amount of time with somebody, yeah, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna feel very unbelievable that it's like, wait a second, because they're also like captured in time, right? Like, so True. this connection you have with with TV people, um, it can be odd to then even realize that they're they've aged. Or in some oh, other cases, yeah. their bodies have changed and they cut their hair. Uh, you know, it's hard for people sure. to wrap their heads around. Of um, course. Which I get. Uh, but yeah, it's, 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 yes, it, the, the feelings can be quite intense. And I think that that's a wonderful thing. What a beautiful uh, legacy to, to leave. If you've touched people's lives in a way and brought them enough joy that when it is your time to go, there is a kind of mass feeling of loss um whether they met you or not exactly i think that's a beautiful thing and a testament to how much uh that person impacted a lot of people oh a hundred percent i mean my god during during the first run through of friends um aka when it originally aired because there have been many run throughs for me since then but during that original one chandler was my guy oh yeah I was like, I I love I love a a goofy smartass, and I'm like, he's just so loyal to her. <laughs> oh, I love so Chandler. I, so it was like, yep, that's that's my guy. I mean, of course, then I hit a certain age, and I went, oh, it's Tribbiani or nothing, baby. <laughs> you did that's, switch, yeah. That's uh, that's just the loins in me talking. <laughs> that's not here. Listen, I routinely say to yeah. people in earnest, I make jokes when I'm uncomfortable. That is a Chandler Bing line. And it's true. I do make yeah. jokes when I'm uncomfortable. Oh, God, um, yes. Yeah. So I think that that's the other thing. Like that show was especially for people of our age, which I know there's a lot yeah. of people our age that listens to this show. Um, it's just such a part of like our zeitgeist of, of our like vernacular of our shared pop culture experience. You know, I could say oh, Chenandler Bong to people and they'd know yes. exactly what I'm thinking about, you know, or what I'm talking about, right? Like their TV yeah. guide. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. What a gift. Love that episode. Uh, so anyway, yes. Rest in peace, Matthew Perry. Uh, much love to all impacted uh, by that loss. Uh, before we get into it, what you drinking over there? You got a Slurpee going? I know where you were before this record. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look, that uh, might be my favorite text exchange you and i have ever done (laughs) yeah having a very specific start time and neither of us even being home at the start time yep Yep. or telling the other we're not gonna be there nope nope yeah yeah feels really right yeah feels really right um, so you, you are having a Slurpee is the point. I absolutely am. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm in, I'm into my McDonald's, uh, diet Coke. <laughs> of course. Couldn't be happier. <laughs> um, listen. Oh God. And I'm also just got the slightest bit of belching happening. Um, this episode we're discussing the giggling granny, the giggling granny. Now this was of yeah. course our, um, October patrons poll winner, uh, over on patreon.com slash true crime and cocktails. Uh, you can vote for one episode we cover on the main feed here a month. And I believe this was a serial killer, was it not? They wanted a serial killer and I just ran with it. I love it. I could not be happier. Uh, Well, listen, let's get into it. Well, before we do though, just a reminder, there's an uh, EP called Sad This Christmas put out by me. Uh, Download it, buy it on iTunes, stream it, give it all the love. Uh, I'm really trying to push it. And I realized I hadn't mentioned it yet. 
All right. So the giggling granny was one of the many nicknames the media game gave to Nancy Doss, a happy go lucky middle aged woman who spent decades hiding a dark secret. While Nancy played the role of a loving wife, mother and grandmother, in reality, she was responsible for the deaths of more than 10 people over the span of 30 years. And what's worse is that each of Nancy's known victims were related to her. So what drove Nancy to kill her own family members? And how did she get caught? Christy Oxborough investigates. I'll be honest, I don't even remember how I came across this woman. Um, well, I'm excited because, as we know, female serial killers, very rare. Very yeah. rare. Yeah. Yeah, this one, she's something else. She's something else. I look forward to it. And and look, of course, in the uh, case file on uh, on our socials, uh, I'm going to post photos of her. But I'll say this, um, and I, because I know I can hear people already. Roseanne Barr could absolutely have played her. Almost spitting image. Like there are photos of her where it's like, wow, the two of them, I could see it. I could see it, but. Neither here nor there. So, disclaimer off the top. This isn't the top. It's the top of the the bit that everyone skips to. <laughs> so it's the, <laughs> it's the top. I know not everybody does, but you know what I mean. I uh, it's the, the top for everyone else. Uh, this episode will contain mentions of suicide, alcohol abuse, intimate partner violence, and child death. So trigger warning for those who need it. Nancy Hazel was born November 4th, 1905 in Blue Mountain, Alabama. For most of her life, she was known as Nanny. So I'm just going to call her that for the entire episode for the sake of consistency. So Nanny had four siblings. Annie was born in 1903. Dovey, born in 1908. Addie, born in 1910. And William in 1915. Their father, James Hazel, was described as hot-tempered, domineering, controlling, and abusive towards his entire family. Their mother, Louisa, known as Lou, was said to be caring and so terrified of her husband that she turned a blind eye to the abuse her children suffered. Nanny later said that her childhood was unhappy and inconsistent. They attended school only sporadically, as James would often choose to have the children stay home to help with chores on the farm, including plowing fields and cutting wood. And not only were the children shoved into work, but they also weren't allowed to play games or play with other children. When Nanny was seven years old, the family took the train to visit a relative in southern Alabama. She later said she was incredibly excited about the trip because it was the furthest she had ever been from home. On the way, the train made an emergency stop, causing Nanny to fly forward, hitting her head on the metal seat frame in front of her. Ding, ding, ding. Yep. Nanny later said she suffered pains and blackouts for months after and chronic headaches and terrible mood swings for the rest of her life. When Nanny became a teenager, she became obsessed with her mother's romance magazines, especially the Lonely Hearts Club ads, which are just basically old-timey personal ads. Uh, Nanny would spend hours going through the magazines and dreaming of finding her Prince Charming. But that was nearly impossible because her father refused to let any of his daughters attend any sort of school, church, community social of any kind the belief was that james was worried that if he lost his daughters to marriage um then he'd lose all of that those free uh farm hands wow yep yep uh james said that when he decided that his daughters were ready to get married then he would be the one to choose their husbands i know it was a different time but in a single word Gross. <laughs> yeah. In early 1921, Nanny went to work at the Linen Thread Company, uh, where she met 17-year-old Charlie Braggs. Charlie supported his mother and respected his elders, so James was immediately supportive of the union. And after just four months of meeting, James pushed Nanny and Charlie to get married on May 8, 1921. 
Most accounts say that Nanny was 16 at the time, but she was born in November 1905, so that would make her 15 at the time of her wedding. Charlie had just turned 18 when they got married. Charlie's mother, Peggy, lived with the newlyweds and was said to be overbearing, oppressive, and verbally abusive. Nanny later said that Peggy completely took over Nanny's life. It was said that if Nanny wanted to go out, but Peggy did not, then Peggy would just immediately fake a dizzy spell or a stomach cramp until Charlie agreed that they'd just all stay home. And while some may say that Peggy might have been truly ill, as soon as they agreed to stay home with her, she suddenly felt perfectly fine. I mean, I'm not going to get into it, but it it has been said, not all the time, but in a lot of cases, there is a weird thing between mothers and their daughters-in-law. It's like they are subconsciously trying to compete to prove who the son likes more. So it's possible that Peggy was just jealous of the attention her son was showing his wife and she did her best to try and get the attention focused on her. Mm. But it was said to cope with the overbearing mother, both Charlie and Nanny resorted to excessive drinking and having extramarital affairs. Whoa! Nanny claimed that Charlie would sometimes leave the family for days at a time. And somehow through it all, the couple had four daughters in very quick succession, including Gertrude in January 1922, Zelmer sometime in 1923, Florine in August 1924, and Melvina in December 1926. Sadly, two of the daughters died at young ages. But here is where things get frustrating time-wise. Most places claim that Gertrude and Zelmer both died in 1923. Others claim the deaths occurred in 1927. But I found a newspaper article about Gertrude's death from September 1923, so I have to assume that that is accurate. Uh, Gertrude was less than two years old at the time of her death. It was said that Gertrude was fine in the morning, but that by noon she was incredibly ill. Her cause of death was said to be food poisoning. There is very little information about Zelmer. It appears she either died right before or right after Gertrude, which would make Zelmer less than a year old at the time. Some believe that due to the family's financial struggle that Nanny poisoned her daughters, to spare them from having to potentially starve. But of course, if Nanny did in fact kill her children, then no possible excuse would ever be acceptable. Zelmer and Gertrude's deaths were ruled to be accidents, but Charlie was very skeptical about it. He later said both he and his mother, Peggy, were terrified of Nanny to the point that they refused to eat any food that she made while she was in a bad mood. Jesus. In 1927, Charlie had had enough, and he left Nanny, taking their daughter Malvina with him. Why he left his daughter Florine behind, we'll never know. After he left, Nanny moved back in with her parents and took a job at a cotton mill in nearby Anniston. Charlie returned to Blue Mountain in the summer of 1928, but he wasn't looking to reconcile with Nanny because he outright asked her for a divorce. Mainly because Charlie had recently met a, a divorcee that he wanted to marry himself. So he agreed to leave their daughter Malvina behind if Nanny agreed to a divorce, which she did. Charlie later claimed that his reason for divorcing Nanny was because he was afraid of her. But I find it surprising that if Charlie was really that scared of his wife, that he would willingly leave his daughters in her care. Ugh. Soon after the divorce, Charlie married Beatrice Killingsworth, which is the most soap opera name I've ever heard. I love it. Um, Beatrice had a one-year-old son named Roy. In October 1930, Charlie and Beatrice uh, had a daughter 
named Victoria. So as Charlie moves on with his life, Nanny attempted to do the same. She spent most of her spare time responding to Lonely Hearts ads in the local newspaper. And in 1929, 23-year-old Nanny responded to an ad written by Robert Harrelson. Harrelson? Um, he was known as Frank. Uh, he was a 23-year-old factory worker. I believe Franklin was his middle name, and so he went by Frank. I didn't have to justify it. Uh, so Frank sent Nanny a photo of himself, along with some poetry that he had written. Nanny responded by sending a photo of herself, a homemade cake, and some racy letters. From I obviously didn't read any of them because they're not available, but I get the impression, like, leaning more towards the fairy smut without the fairy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Frank responded by driving the 12 miles or 18 kilometers south from Jacksonville, Alabama, where he arrived on Nanny's doorstep and proposed. Wow. <laughs> on October 29th, they were married. So they got married, like, quick. Yeah. Nanny and her daughters, Melvina and Florine, moved in with Frank in Jacksonville. Unfortunately, it turned out that Frank drank heavily. And as a result, the Jacksonville police often showed up at their home as much as twice a week to tell Nanny that Frank had been put in jail because of a drunken brawl. Nanny then learned that Frank had previously spent time in jail for assault. Frank was also physically abusive towards Nanny and would yell and threaten the children for seemingly nothing. And yet Nanny and Frank remained married for 16 years. From the best I can tell, Nanny's daughters lived with her until they each got married. But according to a 1940 census, Melvina and Florine, who were 14 and 17, respectively, were living with Charlie and his new wife. Maybe they were just there the day the census took place. Maybe Charlie listed them, even though they didn't live there. I don't know. Often with older cases, the dates get mixed up so easily, and it is crazy-making. <laughs> it's it's beautiful to have all these old records to go through, but then when things conflict, it just you start talking to yourself out loud a lot. Of course. And worrying your family <laughs> that something's wrong with you. But. Regardless as to where the girls were living, both Melvina and Florine moved out when they got married. From the best I can tell, Florine married a man named James Mashburn in 1943 when she was 18. I couldn't find anything about James, uh, but it also, he, no offense, James, uh, didn't seem relevant to the story, so I gave myself a break and didn't look very far. <laughs> I think that's more than fair. Sometimes you just got to know when to stop. Uh, Melvina married Byron Higgins in March 1942. He was 22. She was 15. Ugh. Again, it was a different time, but, you know. In June the following year, Melvina gave birth to a son named Robert, and in February 1945, she was pregnant again. But that second pregnancy was particularly difficult on Melvina, so she called her mother, Nanny, to ask her to be at the hospital when she gave birth. Nanny showed up and stayed by Melvina's side throughout the entire labor, including wiping Melvina's forehead continuously throughout the night. But finally, a healthy baby girl was born. But within a few hours, even before she was given a name, the baby was dead. Now this small bit is going to be tough to hear. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give a trigger warning if someone wants to just skip ahead, fully understand. I'm going to be as quick as possible. Um, doctors could not figure out how the child had died, but Malvina who was only semi-conscious after the labor, said that in the middle of the night, she glanced over to see her mother holding the baby. And in that moment, Malvina thought she saw Nanny stick a hat pin in the baby's head. Oh my God. 
<laughs> yeah. Yep. Wow. Okay. Mel- Melvina confronted Nanny about it. Nanny, uh, who claimed innocence, said Melvina was just groggy and tired from the labor, so she was just seeing things. Five months later, in July 1945, Melvina and her husband got into an argument, so Melvina went to stay with her father, while her son Robert went to stay with Nanny. While in Nanny's care, Robert died from asphyxiation. He was two years old. Oh! Nanny was absolutely distraught. She screamed and wailed at the funeral before fainting when the coffin was lowered. Everyone believed it to be a tragic accident, but what most family members didn't know was that months later, Nanny collected a $500 life insurance policy that she had taken out on the child. Oh my God. That $500 is equivalent to about $8,500 in 2023. While the doctors may have ruled Robert's death to be asphyxia from unknown causes, I think it's pretty safe to assume that Nanny was involved, especially when it turns out she took out a life insurance policy on a child. Taking a policy out on a child that is not your own is sketchy at best. I don't think that that should be legal. I need to believe it currently is not, but I didn't look into it because I don't want to know, but yeah. it's just, to me, it doesn't make sense. It's like, why would they need that? I want to know when she took out the policy, but. And how, well, yeah, I guess maybe because she's like the maternal grandmother or something. I don't know. That just seems, yeah, very sketchy. But of course, because she was so distraught, no one considered that the grieving grandmother could be responsible for killing a child even though this was now the second child they believe she killed in less than six months. But Nanny continued on with her life, as though she hadn't brutally murdered her two grandchildren, which, uh, spoiler alert, I fully believe that she did. Um, There is no physical proof. It's just my personal opinion, but I stand by it. But before I continue with Nanny's story, I want to talk about Melvina. Because she deserves her own side note. I can't even begin to imagine what she went through, starting with her childhood, where her parents argued and then her father took her away and separated her from her sister. Then the poor girl gets married at just 15, which, yes, was commonplace at the time, but could also mean it was maybe Melvina's way of trying to escape her mother and move out. Who knows? Now, I don't know what that marriage was like. Maybe there were no arguments until the death of their daughter. I don't know. But to lose both of your children just months apart is horrific. I can't even imagine. So it is no surprise that the deaths tore that marriage apart. And it makes things even sadder to think, like, would that couple have remained together if their children had lived? If that's possible, then Nanny destroyed more parts of Melvina's life than she realized. But Melvina and Byron got divorced, and shortly after, she met a man named Charles Leonard. Now, they might have been married briefly. I couldn't find a marriage certificate. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But Melvina changed her surname to Leonard for a while. So it's possible they did get married, but it's also possible that Melvina changed her name to give the appearance that she was married when she gave birth to the couple's child. Peggy Lou Leonard was born September 9th, 1946, when Melvina was 19, and Charles was 10 days away from his 29th birthday. But this is where things get complicated and caused my brain to have a near breakdown trying to keep it all straight. Based on marriage records, just five days after giving birth, Melvina married a man named Robert Haynes. Melvina was 19. Robert was 43. Oh, boy. 
At first, I thought maybe it's a different Melvina Braggs Leonard. What are the odds of that? Um, who got married to that guy less than a week after having a baby with someone else. But the marriage records that I found include the names of both the bride's and the groom's parents. So I was able to verify it was the right Melvina. To be clear, I'm not judging either way. Marry who you want, when you want, all that. To each their own. I'm just saying there were a lot of names and dates for me, and trying to put them in order got confusing real fast. For example, Melvina married Robert Richard Haynes, on September 14th, 1946. But then on January 25th, 1947, which is like four months later, Malvina married Mosey Elmer Haynes. So at first I thought, that's weird. Same last name. Maybe for some reason Robert changed his first and middle name so they got legally married a second time. But both Robert and Mosey have the same parents listed in the marriage records. However, they were born on different days and different years. So I think Melvina married Robert in September, divorced him, and then married his brother Mosey four months later. Is the best that I can tell. Wow. Ah, uh, yeah. I, again, the entire thing... Um, kind of made me look like that gif of charlie day in front of the murder board where he looks a little intense just like a full brain breakdown isn't it also interesting that she named her baby peggy lou and her overbearing mother-in-law was named peggy byron oh, well mom? it would have been nannies uh right well it yeah. oh yeah i guess yeah. it was it was it was nanny's was it? It was yes. Nanny's mother-in-law. Still, it feels close enough to me that it's oh, like. But it's her paternal grandmother. Right. Oh, there it is. I don't know. <laughs> Again. <laughs> yeah, my brain melted, too. I was like, wait a second. What oh, did she name it after that terrible woman? And you're right. No, no, that's what it is. It's but, just but again, a but case also, of. But yeah. OK, yeah. Yeah, look, it's it's the the thing is usually you'll just see like here's the record, but these were like here is like a photocopy or like we've done like we've scanned it in. You can see the physical thing that people have handwritten. So you can see these things and then you're like they got she married two different people 4 months apart and they had the same parents? Did she marry brothers? What's going Oh um, yeah, that's wild. The, and I don't know. The, the the thing is, I don't know. Her story keeps going and getting t more twisted and more confusing. And well, and then know. listen, because I want to try and redeem myself for my dumbass comment. Maybe she named that big that baby Peggy as an F U to Nanny. That is because possible. that makes because she obviously Nanny did not have a great relationship with Peggy. So maybe that was an extra like flip of the bird. There you go. I made some sense out of something. Please continue. You did great. Oh, so the best sense that I can make of it. Melvina has a baby. A week later, she marries 43-year-old Robert. Four months after that, she marries his 36-year-old brother. Then in March 1951, Melvina and Mosey have a daughter named Janice Haynes. Then things went south with Mosey. I assume they divorced. And a year after giving birth, Melvina married Carl Hedrick in April 1952. She was 25. He was 26. Good for her. They eventually divorce. And on July 26, 1959, Melvina marries David Aldridge in Montgomery, Indiana. She was 32. He was 47. On the marriage record, the bride listed her name as Melvina Braggs Leonard, which is interesting since she hadn't been a Leonard since 1946. She also claimed that this was her fifth marriage. So if her and Charles, who had the baby together, had gotten married, 
then her marriage to David would have been her sixth. So maybe this means her and Charles didn't get married legally at the time. She just changed her last name more than possible. But yeah. then why marry someone else? I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's just, I want <laughs> to present the information and it just gets complicated. So <laughs> I love, are these details important? No. But if I have to break my brain to try and keep them all straight, I'm taking you all down with me. Heck yeah. Yeah. The whole point about talking about Melvina was I was hoping I could show that she had a beautiful, happy life after the nightmare that her mother caused. And who knows, maybe Melvina was happy. Lord knows she deserved happiness, especially uh, after dealing with her mother. And speaking of her mother, I'm still baffled as to why Nanny would kill Malvina's children in the first place. Did it anger Nanny to see her daughter living the happy life that Nanny wanted? Was Nanny trying to get some sort of sick revenge on Malvina? Because her first husband took Malvina away from her all those years ago. Is it possible the deaths of Malvina's children were some sort of sick practice leading up to a, another death? for example. Which leads me to about two months after uh, two-year-old Robert died, Japan surrendered uh, and World War II officially came to an end. On the night of September 14th, Nanny's husband Frank went out to celebrate with some friends who returned home from overseas. By the time he got home, Frank was so drunk that he forced himself on Nanny despite her saying no. Frank allegedly told her, quote, if you don't listen to me, woman, I ain't gonna be here next week. The following day, Nanny dug up Frank's jar of moonshine from its usual hiding spot in the flower bed. She topped it up with rat poison and put it back. Later that night, Frank died from what the doctor ruled to be food poisoning. He was 39 at the time of his death. Nanny simply washed out the empty moonshine jar and cashed in the life insurance policy she had on her husband. She used the money to buy a house and a plot of land near Jacksonville, Alabama. So with three deaths occurring in the span of just seven months, it almost feels like Nanny used her own gra grandchildren as a way to practice before killing her own husband. And if we are to believe that Nanny also poisoned her two daughters 20 years earlier, that means by 1945, Nanny's death toll was up to five. And spoiler alert, she was just getting started. This is fascinating. Oh, my word. All right. Listen, I've got a lot of thoughts. I uh, cannot wait to find out what happens next. So let's take a quick break, grab a drink, hit the can, and we'll be right back with more on the uh, Giggling Granny Nanny Doss episode of True Crime and Cocktails. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing the Giggling Granny, a.k.a. Nanny Doss. What's next? Um, I, well, I'm just going to say for the people uh, during the break, it was like the first thing she said to me when we, when we hit pause, was just so fucking charming. Uh, it was just, she's going to giggle at some point, right? I was like, yeah, shit. I guess I should have mentioned she will. I never, I was, listen, there's a oh, reason I, I didn't, you didn't say it doubt. on the air because I was like, I know it'll come. Oh, I know. But it was just such a cute, like. You really, I mean, you called the episode that, like you really led with giggling and then gave us no giggling. You gave us yes. multiple warnings in the beginning. Yeah. A lot of horror, not a lot of giggles. Yeah. So far. Yeah, we'll get there. Well, I mean, giggles for her, not for any of us. Oh, of course. Yeah. Because this woman's a horror show, but not neither here nor there. So as I mentioned earlier, Nanny's second husband, Frank Harrelson, died September 15th, 1946. Nanny used the life insurance money uh, to buy a house outside Jacksonville, Alabama. And then Nanny went right back to doing what she loved best, which was responding to Lonely Hearts ads in the newspaper. 
and even placing her own ad. Nanny then traveled around the country. It was suggested she spent time in New York and possibly Idaho. It was said that she might have married a man named Hendricks. I couldn't tell if they meant first or last name. I found nothing about him, uh, and since we don't know his full name, we can't verify if they were married or if he maybe mysteriously died mm. after being around her. Um, but when Arlie Lanning responded to Nanny's Lonely Hearts ad, she traveled to Lexington, North Carolina to meet him. Arlie was a 47-year-old widower whose wife, Viola, died in September 1946 at the age of 29. Oh, God. Yeah. Just two days after meeting Nanny in 1947, Arlie and Nanny got married. It's the quickness for me at this point that it's just like, well, just skip the dating. We may as well just get to it. Yeah. But like husband number two, husband number three struggled with alcohol and had as much of a wandering eye as Nanny did. Unfortunately for Arlie, uh, whenever he was caught cheating, Nanny would pack her bags and leave for days, weeks, or even months at a time. Every once in a while, Arlie would receive a telegram from Nanny just telling him where to send her money. Arlie blamed himself for Nanny's absences, knowing that they were caused by his affairs. So whenever Nanny would return, Arlie would become, would like welcome her with open arms, no questions asked about where she was, what she did. And then he would do his best to try and remain sober and faithful. But the moment he started drinking and womanizing again, Nanny would leave. Sometimes she uh, would say she was visiting family. Other times she would give no reason at all. In June 1950, Nanny went to Gadsden, Alabama, to visit her sister, Dovey, who had just been diagnosed with cancer. Within days of Nanny's arrival, Dovey died in her sleep at the age of 42. And while Dovey was sick at the time of her death, it is believed that Nanny poisoned her because her health took a dramatic downturn the moment that Nanny arrived. This is wild. <laughs> <laughs> then in September 1950, Arlie's mother, Sarah Lanning, just happened to pass away in her sleep during a visit from Nanny. Sarah was 85 at the time of her death and is believed to be one of Nanny's victims. 1951 seemed to pass by without incident, but around Valentine's Day in 1952, Nanny's husband, Arlie, started suffering from severe abdominal pains and dizziness. Two days later, on February 16th, Arlie died at the age of 52. Due to Arlie's history of heavy drinking, without bothering to do an autopsy, the, do the doctor determined that Arlie's death was likely caused by heart failure. And that the symptoms Arlie felt during his, like, right before his death, uh, were probably just from the flu that was going around. At the funeral, Nanny said, quote, He just sat down one morning to drink a cup of coffee and eat a bowl of prunes I especially prepared for him. Up until then, why, let me tell you, he looked in fine shape. Then two days later, dead. I nursed him. Believe me, I nursed him. But I failed. She went so far as to say that Arlie's last words to her were, quote, Nanny, it must have been the coffee. So at this point, Nanny is just outright getting bold with her poisonings to poison your husband and then tell people at the funeral that he got sick after the food that you especially prepared for him is so bold to me. And then to be like, he thought it was the coffee. Hmm. Can I also I, just add that, like, yeah. one, how much preparation do prunes need? And two, what a slap in the face. Like, your final meal is a bowl of prunes? Like, my God. Like, at least put it in yeah. a, a 
grilled cheese sandwich or something to give you a bit of a culinary delight before you cross over. Sure. Feels like a second slap in the face. Oh, yeah. It's horrific. I I mean, then you get even sadder and think maybe all he ate were prunes. God, is yeah. that, how old was he? 59? Is that, or 52? Is that, is that what I have to look forward to? Yeah. In a decade, just prunes? <laughs> No, we have modern things now. We can we can do other things. We know other <laughs> sources of fiber. We have modern things now. I like that a lot. <laughs> uh, so the thing I think that Nanny did not count on is that when Arlie died, he left the house to his sister. So Nanny was left with nothing. But wouldn't you know, the weirdest thing happened just two months after Arlie's death. The house completely burnt down. My God. Thankfully, Nanny wasn't home at the time because she literally just left right before the fire started. Thank God. The insurance company then issued a check to Arlie Lanning, deceased as opposed to the home's new owner. So even though the house was left to Arlie's sister, Nanny was the one who cashed the check from the insurance company for it. Wow. <laughs> and what did Nanny do with a small portion of that money? Well, she joined a dating service called the Diamond Circle Club. For just $15 a year, Nanny received a list of eligible bachelors every month, and she immediately set her sights on a recently retired salesman, Richard Morton, from Emporia, Emporia, Kansas. While Richard was slightly older than Nanny usually went for, he was not a drinker like her first three husbands, so Nanny decided to give him a chance. Richard was also a widower whose wife, Viola, died in March 1952 at the age of 67. Two husbands in a row that both had previous wives named Viola. What are the odds of that? I thought that I remembered that, but I've been so spooked about my gaffe with Peggy. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to say it and be wrong again. But yeah, that is weird. I doubled. I As soon as I wrote it, I was like, there's no way. I must have fucked up. And I went back to double check their relationships multiple times. And I was like, what the hell is that? Anyhow, so Richard, for whatever reason, probably because she was so giggling there, I had to throw it in there somewhere. Um, he was so smitten with Nanny that he wrote a letter to the Diamond Circle Club asking them to remove both his and Nanny's names from their singles list. He also thanked them for introducing him to, and this is an, a direct quote from that letter, the sweetest and most wonderful woman he had ever met. The couple were soon engaged in late 1952, and Nanny was living her best life. Richard spoiled her. He constantly bought her gifts. But soon Nanny learned that Richard was also buying gifts for another woman that he was seeing on the side. Enraged, Nanny went back to answering Lonely Hearts ads before their wedding even took place. Although she told her would-be suitors that she was a widow, and maybe for Nanny at the time, it was wishful thinking. Oh, um, I mean, technically she was a widow, but she just neglected to mention that uh, Richard existed. So at this point, Nanny had to decide, is she going to outright leave Richard for cheating on her? Or is she going to marry him anyway? And let him suffer the same fate as her last two husbands. But before Nanny could plan to go either way, her mother, Louisa, a.k.a. Lou, reached out to say she's going to come live with Nanny. Because Lou's husband, James, died in March 1952 at the age of 76. And now Lou was ill and she didn't want to live on her own. Sadly, I don't know Nanny's whereabouts at the time of her father's death, and I don't know his official cause of death, but I'd be interested to know both of those details. 
Yeah. Because I wouldn't be surprised if she killed him too. So Lou arrives in Kansas at the end of December 1952. And shockingly, after complaining of severe stomach pains, she died just days later on January 3rd. Lou was 74 years old. And just so we're clear, yes, Nanny absolutely poisoned her. But Nanny didn't let a little thing like death get in the way of her marriage. So just nine days later, she and Richard were married. At the time, Richard was 63. Nanny was 47. But just four months later, Richard became violently ill. Oh my God. He died the following day in May 1953 at the age of 64. According to his death certificate, Richard died from a coronary condition. But if we've learned anything by now, it's that people should be suspicious when someone becomes violently ill around Nanny, but for some reason, no one was. But they should have been, because Richard actually died after ingesting a thermos full of coffee that Nanny had topped up with arsenic. Shortly after Richard's death, Nanny traveled to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to meet Samuel Doss, one of the men from the Lonely Hearts ads that Nanny had been corresponding with since December 1952. Samuel was a soft-spoken 57-year-old state highway inspector who didn't drink or chase after women. Samuel was also a widow. In early 1928, 33-year-old Samuel married a 23-year-old woman named Winnie. The couple had six children together, including Arnold in 1928, Anna in 1931, James in 1934, Willie in 1936, Ernest in 1939, and Wilma in 1942. Tragically, in April 1945, Winnie and all six of their children died during a tornado. At the time, it was the worst tornado in Madison County history. Approximately 100 buildings were destroyed, numerous people were injured, and 10 people were killed, including 40-year-old Winnie, and her six children, who ranged in age from 3 to 16. So after the death of his entire family, Good which Lord. I can't even imagine, um, he took some time uh, to himself. But then in December 1952, Samuel started writing letters back and forth with Nanny. And in late May 1953, Nanny took the bus to Oklahoma so they could finally meet. Samuel proposed weeks later, and the couple were officially married in July. But Nanny quickly grew bored of Samuel and his rules. Samuel insisted that they both go to bed at 9.30 p.m. every night. And if they were going to have any sort of sex, it had to be scheduled in advance. Ah. He refused to spoil her like her last husband, and he was incredibly strict with money. But the worst part for Nanny was that Samuel believed that any reading or TV viewing needed to be educational. So he especially looked down on her romance magazines, which, of course, were her favorite. Basically, in true crime and cocktails lingo, he yucked her yum. Thank you very much. Nanny decided she was going to take some time and go visit family in Gadsden, Alabama. After a brief visit with her sister, Addie, wouldn't you know Addie oh. suddenly died on August 14th at the age of 42? Jesus! No cause of death was ever given. I think we know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's safe to say. I think it's a pretty easy speculation to make, but you know. Who knows? So while Nanny was gone, Samuel sent letters to her, begging for her to return home. He promised he would change his ways. He changed his bank account so that Nanny would have equal access to it. He took out two life insurance policies on himself, naming Nanny as his beneficiary, which I assume she asked him to. 
because I don't know why he would have just up and done that to bring her back. Um, but I mean, also in his defense, I just don't think he knew she was a murderer. But things seemed okay between them over the next year until a night in September 1954 when Samuel became violently ill after having a piece of Nanny's prune cake. And prunes, man. <laughs> Again with the prunes. Yeah, yeah. Um, the intense stomach pains forced him to go to bed for two days. And after a visit from the doctor, it was recommended that Samuel go to the hospital. Where he stayed for 23 days, he was diagnosed with severe digestive tract infection. When Samuel was released on October 5th, Nanny served him a special welcome home dinner of pot roast. And before you think, oh, God, she poisoned the pork, didn't she? Surprisingly, no, she didn't. She put arsenic in the coffee that she served with the pork. <laughs> and by midnight, Samuel Doss was dead. He was 58 years old. When Dr. Schwelbin heard the news, he was shocked. He was the one who examined Samuel right before his release from the hospital hours before. So the doctor was like, this makes no sense that he would be dead. The doctor then ordered an autopsy and discovered that Samuel's stomach contained enough arsenic to kill several large animals. Finally, an autopsy, right? <laughs> so Dr. Schwelbin went to the police, who immediately brought Nanny in for questioning. At first, she refused to take any blame for Samuel's death. Nanny said she loved her husband and would never have done anything to harm him. The police then pointed out that arsenic is not found in pork or in coffee, uh, so it had to get into Samuel's system somehow. They suggested that Nanny had poisoned Samuel before his first visit to the hospital a month prior. Nanny said, quote, I don't know what you're think what you're talking about. And then she started to giggle like a schoolgirl. Finally. Thank God. <laughs> we, we, we finally got there. Uh, for the most part, Nanny ignored the police and just continued to go through a romance magazine that they let her have during the interrogation. And while that may seem out of sorts, uh, to let, you know, a suspect uh, rifle through a magazine. Um, it was most likely due to the fact that Nanny, based on appearance alone, seemed like a sweet, giggly, grandmotherly type. Of course, we know she was not nearly as innocent as she looked, but to them, they were like, oh, God, I don't know. She's this sweet old lady. We got to leave her. But after a few hours, the investigators were begging her to tell them the truth. She responded, quote, Oh, boys, come on now. I killed nobody. I don't know why you think I did. The head of the investigation, Special Agent Ray Page, stepped in and told Nanny that they had done a background check on her, and they discovered that Samuel was the fourth husband of Nanny's to die from the exact same symptoms. Ray then suggested all four men died from arsenic poisoning. Nanny said, quote, Are you saying, young man, that I killed all my husbands? You're a nice-looking young man, but so foolish. Nanny then giggled and went back to flipping through her magazine. Ray then took the magazine out of Nanny's hands and said, quote, There are others, too, aren't there? A lot of people around you dropped dead over the last couple of couple decades and there's their ghosts are coming back to haunt you they're here nanny in this room put them to rest nanny put them to rest which is i mean the interrogation reads like a film noir yeah you know? and i it really does i'm honestly kind of charmed by it i guess i'm charmed by ray page but um nanny giggled in response to ray's question and then she said quote he wouldn't let me watch my favorite programs on the television, and he made me sleep without the fan on on the hottest nights. He was a miser, and well, what's a woman to do under those circumstances? 
maybe there's a part of me that understands the logic. <laughs> you won't let me watch my shows and you won't let me sleep with a fan on? I mean, for me, it would be just grounds for divorce, obviously. I'm not killing nobody, but uh, yes. I'm just saying, oh. if it was only that, I would get it, Nanny. You have a blood, <laughs> a thirst to kill is the sure. bigger problem. For me, doesn't matter the temperature, I'm going to need that fan on. A hundred percent of the time. Don't care time of year. I yep. would like that fan on because if there's no fan, the air is just, I'm going to choke on it. Oh, and I need the sound. I need the sound. I got a the noise, noise app on yep. my, my phone now for when I go to hotels. I get that. <laughs> that makes sense. So acting as though she hadn't kind of just admitted to murdering her husband, Nanny said, quote, Okay, there you have it. Can I have my magazine back now? Oh my God. And once again, she giggled. Ray said he wanted to hear about Nanny's other husbands first, but he agreed to give her back her magazine if she told the truth. Nanny winked at him and said, It's a deal. <laughs> again, being a little too lighthearted uh, about a, a murder investigation, but... Frontal lobe trauma. Yep. Nanny then told Ray about Frank Harrelson, Arlie Lanning, and Richard Morton. She said she admired them at first, but they each turned out to be duds. Nanny said she only ever wanted romance and a man to love her, but all she ended up with were, in her words, dullards. <laughs> she said, quote, if their ghosts are in this room... They're either drunk or sleeping. <laughs> yeah. When Ray gave Nanny back her magazine, she openly admitted to poisoning all four of her now dead husbands. Or more specifically, she said she put rat poison in Frank's moonshine or rot gut whiskey, as she called it. Uh, and she sprinkled poison on Arlie's food. Then she said she put, po she put arsenic in the coffee she made for Richard as well as the coffee she made for Samuel. Nanny was officially placed into custody, and Nanny told them, quote, I was searching for the perfect mate, the real romance in life. The following morning, investigators were sent to North Carolina, Alabama, and Kansas to oversee the exhumations of Frank Arley, Arley's mother Sarah, Richard, Nanny's mother Lou, Nanny's sister Dovey, and her nephew, Robert. Traces of arsenic were found in the remains of all four dead husbands, as well as Nanny's mother. The remaining victims, Sarah, Dovey, and Robert, all appeared to have died by asphyxia, most likely smothered in their sleep. Nanny's first husband, Charlie Braggs, asked police to exhume the bodies of his daughters, as he believed that they were Nanny's first victims. But with so much evidence against Nanny, the state decided they didn't need more. So Charlie's request was denied. And I, I get that they had Nanny for at least five deaths at that point, but wouldn't it be nice to give a father some closure and, I don't know, maybe the, get those little girls some justice if they were in fact murdered? If you kill 80 people, I would like you to be punished for all 80. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, uh, since the most recent crime and the specific one that got her caught took place in Oklahoma, the state decided that she would only be tried for the death of Samuel Doss. The states where the other deaths occurred wanted to try Nanny in their own jurisdictions, so she was charged with murder in Kansas, North Carolina, and in Alabama, However, she was never tried outside of Oklahoma. The media jumped on the case, and when they asked Nanny what she thought her punishment should be, Nanny responded, quote, Anything they care to do is all right by me. Four separate psychiatrists found Nanny mentally stable and competent to stand trial, so the trial was set for June 2nd, 1955 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But two weeks before, Nanny entered a guilty plea. Soon after, a judge had to deal with sentencing. He debated about 
sent sentencing Nanny to the electric chair, which would have made her the first woman in Oklahoma's history to be executed. However, the death penalty was taken off the table because Nanny was a woman. The judge later said he didn't want to, quote, set a poor precedent by executing a woman. The judge ended up sentencing Nanny to life imprisonment. Even after hearing the sentence, Nanny smiled and giggled for the cameras. The media referred to her as the giggling granny, the jolly black widow, arsenic Annie, lonely hearts killer, lady bluebeard, and self-made widow. I obviously, because of alliteration, arsenic Annie is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my question is, can they not just get together and pick one? Pick oh, one. I know. I know. Each just one comes up with their every, own. And it's yeah, like, and you mm. can't. You got to keep some sort of consistency. It's confusing. Just have a meeting, a quick yeah. sit down. Exactly. Everybody give your options. Take a quick poll. Majority vote. wins. Yep. Let it come to a vote. A hundred percent. Uh, while she only confessed to the deaths of her four husbands, of four of her husbands, I should say, it is believed that Nanny was responsible for at least 12 deaths, including her mother, two of her sisters, two of her children, two of her grandchildren, and one of her mother-in-laws. In an interview with Life magazine, Nanny said she only killed her husbands because of the head injury she suffered in her youth. But Nanny didn't let a life sentence get her down. She even made a joke during the interview that the only prison job she could get was in the laundry because her offers to work in the kitchen were politely declined. Two years into her sentence, Nanny was interviewed by a local newspaper. Nanny said she had grown tired of prison life and she wished she had received a death sentence instead. Quote, I wish the authorities here would let me be tried in Kansas or North Carolina. Maybe they would give me the electric chair. Nanny then commented that she had given up hope that she'll ever be released from prison because if she was released, she'd have to face murder charges in three other states. Yeah, Nanny, that's what happens when you go on a murder spree for 30 years. Yeah. Nanny then mentioned that one of her daughters was sick and that she wanted to be at her side nursing her to help. Oh, We've boy. seen how you nurse people. So, <laughs> no. I just find it a wild statement from a woman who potentially killed two of her daughters and two of her grandchildren. I assume she only mentioned her daughter in the hopes of getting public sympathy and thinking that would be enough to get her released. I also assume the daughter she was referring to was Florine, uh, because Florine died from unknown causes in July 1957 at the age of 32. Mm. So I assume that's who she was referring to. Um, the prison said Nanny was a model prisoner. She always had a smile on her face. Nanny said, quote, time passes so slowly here at prison. Behind my smile is a heavy heart. I have always made people think I was happy, even though I wasn't. So basically... She was bored. She was just bored in prison. I think yeah. she didn't have she didn't have her programs. She didn't have her fun magazines, and I think she was just straight up bored. But what she also doesn't seem um, in any way is remorseful. No, for absolutely any of the crimes she committed, especially those she admits to. Mm -hmm. She admits she killed them, and she feels like he wouldn't let me watch my stories was enough that he should have died but nanny said that by two years into her sentence she suffered two slight heart attacks and she hoped that quote maybe the lord will be kind and take me soon nanny doss died from leukemia in the prison hospital ward on june 2nd 1965 she was 59 years old her headstone reads loving mother which I am skeptical about. Yeah. Especially because the only person left, the only child left who would have chosen what was on that was her daughter, Malvina. Unless that was sarcastic. 
I don't know. Uh, Nanny's first husband, Charlie Braggs, died in January 1975 at the age of 72. Their daughter, Malvina, died in December 1984 at the age of 58. She was buried next to her husband at the time, Charles Leonard. She came back around. She came back around. Around the uh, horn. Ch- Charles Leonard uh, died in June 1988. So, yeah, I at some point after the birth of their daughter, Peggy, I guess they got remarried. It just feels like they had a child. She married four other men, and then they've circled back, is what it seems. I don't know. G- again, no shade. I'm just trying to keep it, it straight. Yeah. And it's just not working. Um, sadly, Melvina's daughter Janice died in December 1982 at the age of 31. So many women in this family dying at young ages. Yeah. Uh, Peggy died in October 2021 at the age of 75. Now, before I go, moments ago, I listed off the nicknames that the media gave to Nanny Doss, one of which was Lady Bluebeard. But Nanny wasn't the only female serial killer given that name by the media. She also wasn't the most famous. That honor belongs to Belle Gunness. Gunness? Guinness. Gunness. It's got to be Gunness. Anyhow. It looks like Gunness. The amount of times I've said it now, just it doesn't sound like a real word anymore. Mm -hmm. So, oh, forgive me. Brynhild, Pulstadter. Streeseth? 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 Fuck. So sorry. It's just there's so few vowels. Yeah. But <laughs> she would later be known as Belle Gunness, and that's what we're going to call her for my own sake. She was born in November 1859 in Selbu, Norway. She was the youngest of eight children. In 1881, Belle immigrated to Chicago in the hopes of finding wealth. In March 1884, she married Mads Albert Sorensen. Between 1884 and 1898, they had four children, including Axel, Carolyn, Myrtle, and Lucy. Sadly, Carolyn died in 1896, and Axel died in 1898. No ages were confirmed for either. It was said that they were either toddlers or infants. Their deaths were said to be from acute colitis, which causes symptoms that are eerily similar to a poisoning. There have been rumors that Belle poisoned those two children for the insurance money. Belle and Mads opened a candy store, and it burned down. So they collected the insurance money. And then their house burned down in early 1900. And again, they just chalked it up to, gosh, that's sad collected the insurance money. Months later, at the end of July, Mads died from a cerebral hemorrhage. He was 45 years old. Coincidentally enough, Mads died on the one day that his two life insurance policies overlapped. It was the last day of his old policy and the first day of his new policy. Wow. So that means Belle was able to receive money from both policies. So I don't buy that he died from a cerebral hemorrhage. But no, neither here nor there. Mad's family were very suspicious and they requested an inquiry, but nothing was done. Belle left Chicago with her with daughters Lucy, Myrtle, and a foster daughter that came in at some point named Jenny Olson. Belle bought a 48 acre farm in Laporte, Indiana. In April 1902, Belle married Peter Gunness, a widower with a seven-month-old daughter named Jenny. Peter's first wife, Jenny, died giving birth to their daughter. Um, I assume that's why he named her after her. Shortly after the wedding, infant Jenny died from mysterious circumstances. Oh, boy. Eight months after the wedding, in December 1902, Peter died of a skull fracture and a subdural hemorrhage. He was 30 years old. When Belle was asked about Peter's death, she said that a sausage grinder fell off a wobbly shelf and hit him in the head. 
But her foster daughter, Jenny, told kids at school that she saw Belle hit Peter on the head with a meat cleaver. In the end, the coroner ruled Peter's death an accident. Accident or not, Bell once again collected the insurance money, and shortly after Peter's death, Bell gave birth to their son, Philip. And then soon after that, Jenny, you know, who uh, was telling kids at school, I saw her murder him. Jenny, just weirdly enough, she disappeared. But if you asked Bell, Jenny was sent to a special school in California. Mm. Bell started posting personal ads in Norwegian language newspapers. One read, quote, A comely widow who owns a large farm in one of the finest districts in Laporte County, Indiana, desires to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided with view of joining fortunes. No replies by letter considered unless sender is willing to follow answer with personal visit. Triflers need not apply. Triflers. I think <laughs> triflers need not apply. Add that to every dating app that you got. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So dozens of men responded to that ad, each bringing money to invest in the farm and each never being heard from again. A man named George Anderson went to the farm, but said that one night he woke up to Belle leaning over his bed with a crazed look in her eye. So he left and didn't come back. <laughs> Saved his own life. One of the farmhands said Belle received male visitors all the time. They added, quote, a different man came nearly every week to stay at the house. She introduced them as cousins from Kansas, South Dakota, Wisconsin. She was always careful to make the children stay away from her cousins. In 1906, Bell was, con uh, was contacted by Andrew Helgelin, uh, who said Bell's ad, who saw Bell's ad in a Minneapolis newspaper. They started exchanging love letters with the final one from Bell reading, quote, my heart beats in wild rapture for you, my Andrew. I love you. Come prepared to stay forever. Yoza. Which I, I get how she felt, like how she was trying to mean it, but dark. On January 3rd, 1908, Andrew moved to Bell's farm. But when Andrew stopped responding to his brother's letters, his brother, Al Osla, there we go, Osla, contacted Bell. Um, she said, oh, shit, yeah, he left, actually. He might be in Chicago or, you know what, he probably just went back to Norway. But of course, Osla did not believe that for a moment. And then on April 27th, 1908, Bell had a meeting with her attorney where she told him that her farmhand, Ray Lamp Lampier, had romantic feelings for Bell and that he resented any man who came to the property. Bell said that Andrew had come to the farm, but Ray, but then Ray flew into a jealous rage and chased Andrew off. Bell told her attorney she needed a will because Ray threatened her life. She said, quote, this man is out to get me. I fear one of these nights he will burn my house to the ground. After leaving the office, Bell brought some, went out, bought some toys for her children, and then also two gallons of kerosene. And later that night, someone, who knows who, uh, set Bell's farmhouse on fire. Mm -hmm. The following day, authorities discovered the bodies of three children and a headless woman in the rubble of the farmhouse basement. The victims were believed to be 48-year-old Bell and her children, 11-year-old Myrtle, 9-year-old Lucy, and 5-year-old Philip. Days later, Ray Lampier was arrested and charged with both arson and murder. He was found guilty of arson, but was cleared of murder. When Andrew's brother, Osla, 
read about the fire in the newspaper, he went to the farm searching for his brother. He spoke with a farmhand who said that Bell asked him to level dozens of soft indentations in the ground, which were supposedly pits of trash. Mm -hmm. When they started yeah. digging through one of those indented areas, they discovered sacks full of random human body parts. Jesus! In all, the remains of more than 40 men and children were exhumed from shallow graves throughout the property. Authorities were unable to identify most of the victims. However, they did identify the body of Andrew among the victims found in the hog pen. Another victim identified was Jenny Olson, the foster daughter who mysteriously vanished after telling kids at school that Belle had murdered Peter. Authorities tried to determine if the headless woman really was Belle or not. There was partial bridge work found amongst the ruins. Um, the bridge work was determined to belong to Belle. However, she was a very tall woman, like we're talking like six feet. But the headless woman's body was like five, three. Um, the body was also found to have strychnine in the stomach. So that person was likely killed before the fire began. Um, also, the head of that body has never been found. Ray Lampier died in prison in December 1909 at the age of 39, but on his deathbed, he said that Bell burned the house down and the headless body was not hers. He claimed that Bell planned the entire thing and left town after nearly emptying her entire bank account. Ray admitted he helped Bell kill 42 men, saying she would poison their coffee, hit them on the head, and then cut up their body and place the parts in various sacks. Ray said his job was to bury the bodies. In 2008, the grave of the headless woman was exhumed to compare the DNA to samples from envelopes that Bell had licked. The tests were inconclusive. So was Bell the woman in the grave? Some people claim that they saw her after the fire, in 1931, a woman named Esther Carlson was arrested in Los Angeles for trying to poison a Norwegian man to take his money. Esther was around the same age that Belle would have been at the time. They had similar features, definitely similar MOs. There was also claims that Esther had a photo of children who looked very similar to Belle's children, Authorities were unable to find any information about Esther prior to 1908, as though Esther didn't exist until Bell's death. Esther died of tuberculosis before a trial could happen. After the bodies were discovered at Bell's farm, the media referred to it as the Death Garden and the Horror Farm, and Bell Gunnis became known as Lady Bluebeard, Black Widow, Indiana Ogress, Hell's Bell, which I believe is my favorite, and the slightly less catchy Mistress of the Castle of Death. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit forced. Yeah. And that, dear listeners, is how you cram two female serial killers with a shared media nickname into a single episode. Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails, I'm Christy Oxborough. Wowzer. Yeah. Listen, she don't stop. There's no reason for your world to implode, even if it isn't a dream. <laughs> you do great work. <laughs> I do read about this late into the night sometimes. So maybe that's part of the problem. Be part of it. Yeah. Well, listen, let's take one more break, hit the can, grab one more drink, and we're going to be back to give some other thoughts and feelings on the giggling granny <laughs> episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Three. On three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing the gr the griggling granny. Doing great. Giggling granny nanny dos. Um, I mean, right out, out the gate, recounting the head injury as a child, especially yeah. the fact that she went forward. She had the front of her head. This yep. is something that we see with 
every serial killer that I've ever researched, that I've ever heard anything about. And it's interesting that later in life, she blamed the murders on that. It's as though someone told her, you know, maybe that's why. And she ran with it because I don't I don't know that back then there was like a ton of knowledge about serial killers to begin with, let alone sure. how they become serial killers and their connection to head injuries. Oh, 100 percent. Um, the names of these children also, and I'm not trying to disrespect the dead, obviously, but what a different time. Zelmer. I have never heard the name Zelmer before. Nope. Never in my life. One. Melvina, Florine, Gertrude, again, just very specific names, but truly how tragic that these young babies, babies, it's, it's, it's so wild. And again, very rare, very rare. I mean, you'll hear about obviously the odd case of, of this kind of um, horror, but for it to be so consistent also that these, it wasn't like she killed her children once out of necessity. It was like she killed them and then she killed a bunch more. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wild. Um, I like that this, uh, her second husband, I think, Frank, sent her pics, poetry. She sent smut. Then he drove over immediately and proposed. I mean, what a different time it was. Smut and a cake. That's all it took. Smut and a cake. That's it. Look, what I wouldn't do for Smutnik. Look, again, I mean, if, yeah. if only, I mean, she would, if if Nanny thought that it was difficult for her to find love back then, if, I, I would have challenged her to live now with the apps. Just feels like it's a much harder game. Sure. Um, have you tried Smutnik cake? <laughs> I just think it's going to attract what I want it to. It's going to tra- attract the triflers. And, I, and, and I'm not making a trifle. For no triflers. Thank you very much. See That's never. like a weird Al version of no scrubs. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Horror show that Melvina's baby died. And then of course that was her second pregnancy. And then of course her two-year-old son. She sends him to go stay with her mother, Nanny. Yeah. I'm look different time. All of these things It was never proven that she killed um, the newborn daughter of hers. But the fact that then immediately the two year old dies, it's like that has to have been a process for Melvina to go through. I'm sure she felt a lot of guilt. Oh, I'm sure of it. Even though, again, the only person to blame is, of course, the giggling granny. Danny he does. Of course. Um, the one thing that I do feel like will be a question mark for me in general in this is what was her motive for killing Melvina's babies? And I know like you're saying, like, like you speculated with some that felt very, um, astute, but I don't know. Like to me, there just didn't like, sure. The second, the second murder, Melvina's first child, Robert. Somehow Nanny managed to take out this life insurance policy on him. So that is motive there. Okay. I can wrap my head around that, even though that's an absolute nightmare uh, in every sense. But the the newborn baby is a tough one. Is it that she didn't want Melvina to be happy? Is it just because she could? Was it just to feel powerful? I mean, I don't have an answer there because that one, I think that's the one, the motive for potentially killing that newborn baby, which we are to believe that regardless of how she may or may not have done it, um, likely was her. She's got a bit of a history. Oh, I would say. I don't know. Like that, I just don't, that one's a bit of a question mark. At that point, it's just like, did she just want to see if she could? She could still do it after all these years because she did it with the kids, her own kids, at that 20 point, years she prior. Hadn't in a while. So, I, yeah, maybe it, it was just, does she have it? Do I have it in me again to do it? It's just yeah. the odds of this, this baby being so healthy. And then the last person seen holding the baby was Nanny. I think and they also- couldn't figure out how she died. So, I mean, 
I think also like, I think there has to be a certain level of this. Not every serial killer loves killing, as we know. Dahmer's a great example of that. It was a means to an end for him. But I I think with her, she liked it. I, I get the oh, impression, yeah. given how she acted later in life, and the fact that it was like, it felt like it became a game to her to like find a new husband and then kill him and find a new husband and then kill him. Like, I think there is a part of her that has to have enjoyed it. And it was dormant for so long. You're right. It was like being offered that opportunity where she was like, maybe it made her think back to when she had killed her own kids or something. And in that moment, she made that decision. I don't know. Again, I know that that's a terrible thing to even begin to, uh, focus on or speculate on it's just so hard to understand that i think that's where my brain always goes is like why though like but why <laughs> why well um, whatever awakened in her assume, yeah i mean of course assuming that she killed her children and killed everybody that we believe she did yeah to go like 20 years and then suddenly to kill like so many people in just a such a small span well, it's also interesting because BTK took a large break, right? Like he he did most of his killings and then he did a very, very large break. And then I don't think he killed again. I think he was just playing with the police when they caught him, which I've talked about many times on this show, which is my favorite sure. story ever that he was like, but if I send you this computer disc, will you have my computer information on it? No, he trusts them. That's again, it's just like, <laughs> you're you're such a fool. Um, <laughs> such a fool. Yeah. Uh, so and then also, who was the other one I was just thinking of that took a large break? Oh, the um, oh, I'm blanking. Patton Oswalt's wife. Oh, the Golden State Killer. Thank you. He His wife was Michelle McNamara, to be clear. <laughs> so sorry. Yes, Patton yeah. Oswalt's, Oswalt's late wife, Michelle McNamara, who basically cracked that case open and led to him being yeah. discovered. Amazing. Um, he took a large break too. He had his like real season of killing right. and then he didn't for a very very long time so that's not abnormal either that there would be this long break it is interesting to me that it felt like yeah it really then she went on a spree it almost not not a not a by definition spree but definitely she went on like then it was just she killed until until she couldn't kill anymore yeah um because it also branched out like she also changed her own mo because we know that she was killing with poison quite often but then also we come to find out later like her sisters that had died in their sleep and i believe her mother-in-law who died in her sleep at one point yep uh, asphyxiation she smothered them yep uh but then of course she did go back to the poisoning when it was dealing with the husbands it's interesting sure. again like the children she seemingly was poisoning as far as we know we don't know but um Oh, but that's not true because Robert was asphy asphyxiation. It's true. Interesting. Robert but the boy, been... also a male. She's true. It flipped with the adults. With when when she was killing the adults, it seems that the women, for the most part, were being smothered and the men were being poisoned. I think there was a couple where, it, but you know what I'm saying? Like it's just interesting. I mean, it is also possible that maybe she only, and it sounds like I'm joking by using this wording. Maybe she slightly poisoned, like just enough to make them pass out so that possible. so that they'd be too weak to fight her. Yeah. When she was smothering them. I think the two year old, she probably he was asleep and she went in and yeah. smothered him. But I think for the adults, it was possibly just weak Well, but the one was a was a mother. much older woman. So that was potentially, and then well, her mother time. and her husband's mother, exactly, were both older. So they might, I mean, it might not have taken much. And and her one sister that had recently been diagnosed with cancer, also, she was very right. ill. So, well, and those ones, she, uh, for the two sisters, and I think the mother-in-law, she had to travel. Right. So it's possible she just didn't take her poisons with her or something. Great point. Yeah. Had to come up with something else. That's wild. Um, when she was saying, I nursed him, 
for some reason, oh. like the term nurse just always makes me think of breastfeeding. It, yes. It's, and I, I, yeah, yeah. It, every time I hear it, I'm like, oh, I don't, that's, um, yep. I know that's not how you meant it, but, ugh. um, <laughs> the <laughs> diamond for that sound. You're welcome. The Diamond Circle Club dating service, $15 a year. I just wrote down, what a deal. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Then after she killed Richard, I just wrote down in all caps, was this all in the same town? Now, I know that she was traveling to kill the family members, but with, yes. but she was staying at the same residence, right? Like she had the farm. She was having multiple husbands, right? Well, she she did leave. Uh, she did move after Richard to Oklahoma to be with Samuel, right? But to the point to Richard, it was a, she was in that same house. Um, she bought well. She bought the house after the third husband Arlie died, and then was in there with the fourth husband Richard. Okay, so I guess she did. I guess my well, my question was is like, how did this not? How did no one clue in? And I know it was a different time, but it just feels odd to me that if this was people in the similar area, sure, you know, certainly her third husband and fourth husband that was in the same area, in a you know decently short amount of time it's just interesting to me that it took so long for someone to connect the dots and go wait a second yeah well apparently i can't remember after which one because again there's just so many of them it was i think it was after the third or the fourth husband the comment was made that like she was so distraught and the community just really rallied around her because they felt so bad for her that her husband had died and it's like, woof, how'd they feel after? Like, I mean, bless them and good for them for coming to her aid and supporting her and all that. But can you imagine like going to someone and being like, oh my God, what can I do to help you? And then finding out they were the murderer? I mean, yeah, it's insane. It's not great. You know that there was somebody who was probably like the whistleblower being like, she likely murdered them. She's there's a pattern happening. And everyone was like, you're terrible. Oh, that I guarantee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it will be us once that time machine happens. Thank you very much. Now, here's a little psychologist hatting for you. Ooh. Samuel Doss, the widower. Yeah. Um, his wife and all six children died in that tornado. Yeah. Tragedy. Something I find very interesting. He had very strict rules. There was a bedtime. All of her reading and television had to be educational. And I just wrote down, he was fathering her. This oh, was yeah. misplaced grief. Oh, he lost sure. six children. And I think, I don't think logically knew why he had this urge to try and take care of her in that way. Again, I'm fairly certain he probably didn't go to therapy. It was a different time, obviously. Um, but I think... If you lose all six of your children at once, that's good. That's a that's a big that's a big adjustment. And I think he was really kind of trying to work work that out because what's interesting too is that after she kind of went away at one point, of course, to kill another one of her sisters, um, he started to try and do anything to entice her home, right? Like I, yeah. I will open up my bank account to you. I will do all the things that you want me to do, et cetera. And it's, it's again, like it wasn't until she kind of threatened to leave him, whether it was literally or metaphorically, that then he just also was like, oh my God, I'll do anything to keep you. Please don't leave me like my entire family did. Very sad. A hundred percent. Very sad. And also, also I'm also curious, like, I mean, I also just want to know the story. Like, how did your wife and six children all die in that tornado? Where were you? Were oh, you I want to know. Did you witness this? Because again, if he was at all a witness to this, that, I mean, this man must have been in like deep PTSD with, without having language oh, for it. a hundred percent. A natural disaster in your area that kills 10 people and seven out of those 10 are your family. And how like, did he survive if he was with them? Like, Oh, that's the thing. I have no idea where he was. Yeah. I have no idea. Like, 
I mean, I guess it's possible because he was a, they said he was a state highway inspector. It's possible he was away working at the time. Yep. Yeah. Which makes it, I don't, I don't know what's worse. I mean, you were there and you were the only one that survived or you weren't there and they all died. Like either way, he's oh have a lot of uh, problems. And I mean, and he certainly did not deserve to be poisoned. But the fact that she did it twice was like, well, didn't work the first time. The fact that she was bold enough to poison him the day he was released from the hospital. Like, think that through, ma'am. Well, at that point, she just said she she was God in her own eyes, right? Because she sure. has gotten away with so many murders that I think at that point she was just like above felt she was above the law. Sure. Like there was no reason for her to try and like cover. Like, I think that that was like her pure narcissism coming out where it was like she doesn't need to cover her tracks. She doesn't need to make it less obvious. She's never gotten caught before. Now, I think she was just super pissed that he didn't die like she thought he would the first time. Yeah, it could be that. I don't know. There's part of me that doesn't, I don't think that she had any emotion about it at all. I think it was just like, sure. oh, now I have to do what I have to do. She doesn't strike. Like, it's interesting too that like the only time we really see any emotion from her in this story that we know of, obviously, is after she got, gets caught and it's kind of glee. Yeah. And it I mean, continues to be that until multiple years into prison and then she's bored. Yeah. And suddenly not remorseful, just I I don't want to be here anymore. Yep. Now you're going to love my next question. Can't wait. Did you say when he got out, she cooked him pot roast or a pork roast? Pork roast. Because I heard pot roast the first time. And sure. then you kept saying pork roast. And I was or you kept saying pork. And I was like, pot roast isn't pork. Correct. It is not. Then I as I assumed and convinced myself I had misheard you. Uh, well, I've been known to uh, say things incorrectly. I meant to say pork roast. I can't guarantee what I did say. <laughs> uh, I meant to say happy meal and said happy hour. So you know what? We're in the <laughs> same, same thing. Boat, maybe. <laughs> Um, it didn't matter at all. It was more just my own, uh, questioning of my own brain. Um, she also, the doctor named Dr. Schwelbin, I, yeah. that just sounded like me saying like, when I, when I try and make a, a name, not a name, sure. Like Shmiano Shreves, like it yeah. was Dr. Schmelbin just felt like it was, or Dr. Schwelbin. Yeah. Feels like it was like a, oh, it's absolutely spelt that way too. Yeah. Yeah, that made me laugh. Um, yeah, then the background check is done. Oh, shit. Four husbands. They all died the same way. Oh, shit. <laughs> wow. This woman's been killing for 30 years. Wow. Do you think that first husband was like counted each day as a blessing? Once He, he has to have. Once he heard about all of the husbands, was he like, damn, I also can't believe she didn't try to circle back. To find a way, not to specifically marry him, but to to have all of them dead. Yeah. Like, yeah. Here's it's a cake. Happy birthday. I know. You know, something. But who's to say she didn't? I don't know. She might have. But it may she have also been. Did she have additional children after him? Like, did she birth additional children after no. him? It may have been that it was like, it's the father of her children. And she just wouldn't do it to him. Possibly. Now, I know it's that wild because she killed some of those children of her own. So that feels like it doesn't track. But I could also see it being one of those things where it was like, well, again, when we look at like BTK and and uh, sure. Golden State and so many, it's like they they do have families and lives that they don't kill. Now, again, the only difference here is that she didn't kill her own kids, which feels impossible to believe. Um, I mean, it is possible she attempted to kill him and we just don't know. There's also that. Because apparently he, after she was caught and it was like very public that it's like she's done this or we think she has some guy in California that she had been talking to. She, she'd she been writing him letters at the same time she'd been writing Samuel letters. Um, she had sent him a cake 
And when it arrived, it wasn't a flavor he liked, so he didn't eat it. And he was like, thank God I spared my own life. And I'm like, sir, she would not have poisoned you unless she was there to know it was happening. Yeah. Like she wouldn't have poisoned you until like, there's no point unless she's legally married to you and can has a life insurance policy. Well, on the or... only thing I will say is that unless she was, she was dipping a toe into seeing what that felt like. Sure. Because there was no real reason for her to kill her mother or her mother-in-law or her sisters. Right. Like, so that is true. Who knows? I mean, I agree with you. It doesn't feel like it adds up. But I also, with this woman, I I would say also, I uh, nothing would shock me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I get that. Um, I think it's interesting that she pled guilty. And then they took the death penalty off the table because she was a woman. Now, I'm curious about when the law must have changed because I feel like, and I could be wrong, but like, obviously, we know in cases, certainly over the last... 40 years like often you plead guilty to avoid the death penalty right like it's sure it's it's interesting to me that there was a time where if you pled guilty you could still get the death penalty and that doesn't again i'm not saying that that's unbelievable or shocking it's just interesting that i love that they were like well we can't set the precedence of of giving women the death penalty um which is so antiquated but they didn't again it wasn't that it was like because the precedence of that is is also like that's a problem. If it was like if you plead guilty, you can still get the death penalty. Then there's never any sort of motivation for anyone to plead guilty. True, right? Then you're never gonna. Then you're just gonna be constantly going to trial. And and anyway, I just thought that that was interesting from a from a law perspective. Of course, um, a death penalty for yeah yeah exactly. I'm just I'm I'm saying yes as I reread my own notes. Now you're gonna love this. Then we get into Bell Gunnis, and this again, this is the thing that bumped you, Lauren. This is the thing that you had no, to wait. then Google in the break. This she took out personal ads in Norwegian, and I was like, she's living in Chicago or in the surrounding area. Yeah, how many newspapers are printing in Norwegian? in that area a lot how many people in that area are 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 uh read and speak norwegian the answer is a lot yeah there was a huge immigration in the late 1800s early 1900s from norway to the upper midwest in the united states yeah i'll be honest okay. there's a i i found a list of about at least 10 men um who went to her farm and never were heard from again. Um, and I, I gave myself the gift of not reading those names because I, nope. Yeah. I, I knew I was going to bumble through them. And uh, I mean, I barely said her name. So uh, yeah. Yeah. There, apparently there were a lot of them. That was a thing. A lot. Yeah. To the point that then by my research that I did very quickly, of course, in 2021, there was almost 5 million Norwegians in the United States, wow. which which feels high to me. I, I, I mean, maybe again, that people are like, why are you bumping on this? But here's what's interesting. As of 2005, so I think in 2005, the number was closer to like four and a half million. Sure. Um, in, but of those, mil those four and a half million, only 39,524 spoke Norway, Norwegian at home at that point. So isn't it also interesting oh. that when they first came in the early eight, late 1800s, early 1900s, there were so many that there was Norwegian new language newspapers. There yeah. were so many people. Um, and, and isn't it so interesting that over the course of a hundred years now, it's like a, a tiny fraction of what is a very kind of large population. Um, yeah still speak it i just think it's always interesting to uh note how these kinds of uh changes happen yeah and you say it's odd that that bumped you i prattled on about <laughs> melvina's husbands which had nothing to do with anything but it's because that's what bumped me yeah. mainly because there were overlapping it didn't make sense nothing seemed to make sense but yeah it's one it's when there's something that you go wait what that 
it doesn't matter how big or how small it is. It's what makes you go, wait a second. That doesn't make sense. That's what's going to throw you. And then you focus on it. I not too that. big, not too small, just the size of Montreal. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> I think it's very dark that she was having the one gentleman like um, dealing with the, well, to use her words, pits of trash. When yeah. we later found out that it was bags of body parts of 40 men and children. Yeah. Um, it just feels like that's not a coincidence. The fact that she referred to it that way. I know that you could say like, oh, she was just saying it was garbage, but I'm like, it's the word pit of trash. That yep. phrase, I was like, it just speaks to mindset to me and how she viewed her victims, in my opinion. Um, just going to say it, going to say it. I feel Hell's Bell was the name for her. I think yes. there was a real misstep. My question yep. is about this, uh, the nickname of of Bluebeard. So I guess that's Lady Bluebeard. Like, I guess that's just comparing them to the pirate. Like, I guess. It feels like a stretch. And the fact that two of them got named that is odd to me. And well, a court, uh, from what I, once I found out that, because uh, uh, it was such a roundabout way where I was just like, are there any other women um, who like murdered multiple of their husbands spoiler alert absolutely yeah um and then i ended up stumbling upon bell and i saw that her, they called her lady bluebeard and i was like that's weird isn't that what i wrote already about nanny so then i had to double check did i just fuck the name up no but very few people called her that right. like so what if you search like lady bluebeard bell is the main person that comes up but i still don't get where they got it from again take a moment sit down everyone gets a vote i just think Most it must have been wins. like bluebeard like murdered a bunch right like it, that i mean maybe i'm wrong but like that felt like it like it felt like it was a simple connection and by the way not good enough no not good enough no. i yeah oh I, here, here's why i literally just google bluebeard bluebeard was a powerful nobleman who was married six times to beautiful women who all mysteriously vanished. Interesting. So you know what? I guess I should shut my damn mouth and it's a it's a more <laughs> clever nickname than they thought. <laughs> Maybe more at the time that was a more well-known story. Um, well, again. you'll love this statement. Was was he a pirate? I don't believe so. So are I, we, confu reading, are we now nobleman. also confusing... <laughs> Bluebeard with Blackbeard. <laughs> First of all, Blackbeard sitting on a bed of rice. Um, <laughs> Blackbeard, yes. I guess I thought if there was a Blackbeard, there must be a Bluebeard. This oh, I just not assumed. made me seem like an intelligent woman. I'm going to be honest. From the beginning, not seeming like a real brain. Um, and that's all right. Yeah. I can't win them all. And that's okay. No. Uh, if you... I absolutely thought when i saw lady bluebeard i might i guarantee my first thought was oh so like the pirate so yeah. i have because bluebeard absolutely sounds like a pirate but is that because blackbeard's a pirate i don't know was there a pirate bluebeard <laughs> oh i put in bluebird <laughs> it was great I, I hope the answer to that is yes Pirate uh, blue bird, bird sounds nice. Blue beard, not a pirate, but was linked to piracy. That's nice. Not for. Mm, no, sorry. Know. It's because people always conflate him with black. <laughs> what I like is we could have just left it and nope. been like, maybe, and then like come back next week and be like, so we made an error. But what we like to do instead is no, because we're going to forget. Yep. So the, like the second we hit stop on this record, we just, it flies, just flies out of our brain like yep. a bluebird. Um, <laughs> and blue so bird. I just feel yep. like for us, our go-to is, no, nope, we're going to double check our work right this second, because if we don't, we'll forget. And yep. you can find out in real time. And yeah, I, there have to be people out there who are like, I thought Bluebeard was a pirate. I pray. I pray. Because otherwise, again, I feel like I'm coming off like a real dum-dum in this episode. But you know what? No. 
We all have our days. We all have our days. To to quote some superstore, which I never do. Sometimes you get the giraffe. Sometimes you get the wig. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. Um, but listen, uh, fantastic work as always. This was a wildly compelling episode. I was riveted, even though, again, there was times it felt like I wasn't comprehending words. Um, just know <laughs> that I enjoyed every damn second of it. And I appreciate your work now and always. <laughs> uh, look, this isn't on you. I think I brought madness with me into this. But also, it, you just hear so many things that you go, oh, that can't be what I heard. Because it's insanity. Yes. But it, no, no. No, she uh, she absolutely did what she did. So, absolutely. And listen, uh, we thank you, dear listeners, for coming with us on this wild ride. If you haven't already, give us a follow on the socials on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails on Twitter at Not Detectives. If you'd like some more content, some bonus content, go over to patreon.com slash true crime and cocktails to learn more about our subscription based service over there. And of course, the only place. To get official True Crime and Cocktails merch is, of course, truecrewmerch.com. So check that out as well, if you haven't already. Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? On the next True Crime and Cocktails, Randy Roth. No idea who that is. (laughs) Cannot wait to learn more about it. Uh, Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Goodnight, Matthew Perry. Goodnight, Chenandler Bong.